Welcome to the Lynch Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, Joey and Sarah are going to talk through the 10 pieces of gear that photographers should acquire first. They say gear won't make you a better photographer, and I totally agree, but you do need some basics to get started. And with so many choices and accessories available, it can be tough to figure out where to start. We don't have all the answers, but hopefully we'll be able to recommend some first steps. Here are Joey and Sarah. Hey, Joey. Hey, how's it going? Going good. Are you ready to talk about some gear? Yeah, let's do it, Sarah. (laughs) This actually, preparing for this episode, kind of had me going down memory lane of the first horrible purchases I made. What was your first camera that you bought? Uh, My very first digital, my mom helped me buy it. It was a Nikon D40. And man, I outgrew that thing fast. (laughs) How many years ago was that? That was 2007. That's, you know, that's a fine, that was probably a fine camera at the time. I started with a D, a Nikon D200, which was also an amazing camera when it was new, but I did not buy it when it was new. Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, that's what we're talking about. The first purchases you should make if you're getting into photography or if you've kind of been playing around with it a while and you actually want to start being organized, making a career out of it or just being leveling up your work a little bit, that there are at least 10 things that you should set your sights on getting pretty soon. And the obvious place to start is the camera. Right, right. You can't really take pictures without a camera. I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, you can, make, <laughs> you can make a pinhole camera if you want. <laughs> sure. There's sure. a tutorial on our YouTube if you really want to. Uh, but, you know, yeah, you got to buy a camera. And we're talking specifically about digital cameras. Uh, Joey, what what should we be looking for? For your first camera, I, I usually recommend, uh, like these days, your entry-level stuff is pretty great. It's going to be better than stuff that was made like top of the line five years ago, which five years ago, top of the line was pretty great. But usually what I recommend is getting spending as much money as you can without breaking your bank. So get the best camera you can. Like a mid-level body will probably last you longer because it'll grow with you more. Entry-level cameras, you may outgrow pretty quickly. Like in my own case, I bought a D40. I used it for six months. I shot the hell out of it. And then uh, my wife at the time and I took our uh, our income tax returns and I bought a Nikon D3. So a bit of a jump there. But I held onto that camera for, I don't know, three, four years. Yeah, it's important to remember that your cameras are not going to hold value as much as your lenses are. So don't think I'll buy this and then I'll be able to sell it for what I paid for it. That's not that's not going to happen. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the digital cameras aren't an investment. Uh, film cameras used to be an investment because it would last you your, your entire career if you wanted to. But digital, it's just a commodity. It's a means to an end and it has to be upgraded at some point. And, you know, that's not to say that you have to spend a fortune on a camera. Um, I'm of the opinion that get something that is new and you don't want to get the most basic camera that doesn't have manual controls, um, but you don't have to get the most pro level camera. For example, you know, I shoot with a 5D Mark IV a lot, but if I were just starting out, I would be happy with a 6D Mark II or a T8i or an 80D. Absolutely. Absolutely. The mid-level cameras are really great bargains these days. They're going to do literally everything you need and should last you a long time. But what you don't want to do is go back in time and get a T4i because it's $300 on Craigslist. That's ultimately just going to be frustrating (laughs) and throwing your money down the drain, in my opinion. And I think you can get those cameras I just mentioned, like the T8i, the 6D Mark IV, to in between like nine hundred and fifteen hundred dollars, which, I mean, that is money, but is such a little amount compared to the three, four, five thousand dollar models. Right, and you know, if if you're going into this with the idea that you want to make money, that investment becomes you know even more trivial. Uh, hopefully, you're making money with it, but but you know, cameras these days, I wouldn't pull your hair out looking at specs too much because when you're starting out all of our modern digital cameras that have come out in the past few years are good um so 
there are things you want to consider like sensor size, low light performance and that kind of thing. But Mm -hmm. know that you're not going to be really underprepared with a brand new camera. So can you talk a little bit about those those things that you do kind of want to consider, like comparing sensor sizes? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's still popular to look down on crop sensors and really hold full frame in the highest esteem. But for the most part, you're, you're not going to see any difference between the two. Sensor size, the larger the sensor, the narrower the depth of field. So people that do por- like heavy portrait work think they really like a full frame sensor, which I'm sure they do. Yeah, everyone starting out wants to get all the blur. Right. The most right. the most <laughs> blur possible. That's that that's a full frame sensor. Yep. They want to shoot wide open as po- like every chance they get. They just want the narrowest depth of field possible. It's hey, and no shame. It's part yeah, of it. it right, it's part right. of it. We've all done that. <laughs> uh it's a process, you know. <laughs> uh I think I think the thing that most people get hung up on is which brand. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll have Nikon fanboys and Canon fanboys and Sony fanboys and girls, you know, these days there's not really a better brand. All the companies are putting out equally good offerings. What it really comes down to is size, weight, and ergonomics. So when you're out there looking, if you can get your hands on cameras and see how they feel in your hand, how they're going to you know, work with your own body. If you like the menu system, those are going to be the more important things because those things will get in your way when you're shooting if you don't like them. Yeah. I mean, really think about what am I even going to be doing with these images? How much does it matter? My sensor size and practicality. What kind of images are you making? Are you doing street photography? Do you need that camera to be able to just fit in a small bag or you're not going to end up taking it anywhere? Right. Um, those are all things to think about. And and these days, uh, current offerings are so good at higher ISOs that even that is less of a consideration unless you think you're always going to be shooting at night or in like a dark club or something. Like if you're, a, if you're trying to get into concert photography, high ISO is important. But if you're just doing portraits and weddings and things like that, ISO doesn't really matter at all, especially on current offerings. Resolution these days is a big, uh, is kind of equalized across the board. Everything is 20 plus megapixels, which is going to be more than you ever need to print anything you want to print. Neither one of those things is a deal breaker. And neither one of those things is really something you'll have to think like long and hard about like, "Mm, this camera is better at at 6,400, but this one's pretty good at 3,200. It's like, well, there's not much of a difference there. They're still great. Absolutely. And one thing that's not really negotiable, in my opinion, is you need to have a camera that is interchangeable lens. You want to be able to choose what lenses are on your camera, which brings us to our next second most important item, which is a lens. And this one will get you into trouble if you don't know what you're looking for. It totally will. (laughs) (laughs) You know, when you're first starting out, a lot of people want everything. They want a lens that can do everything that can be wide, that can zoom, you know, all the way out to, I don't know, 800, something crazy. Or you'll just get the lens that comes with the package because it's cheaper and you don't know what you're looking for. And these are not the routes that you want to go. Not at all. Do you remember your first good lens? Oh, I remember my first bad lens. (laughs) (laughs) So I don't, okay, I don't want to shade anyone, but I thought I was doing my due diligence and researching lenses to buy. Now, I was in school for photography, and um, there was a popular um, photography blogger at the time, um, initials KR. (laughs) 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 Um, The infamous. (laughs) And he was saying like, I shot the birth of my first child with the Nikon 18 to 200. Oh, the first super lens. It is a do everything lens. It's great. Um, And I didn't know anything. And um, 
I thought, you know, it's a little bit out of my budget. I think it was like $600 used. Mm -hmm. I said, it's a little bit out of my budget, but I really want the best. So I bought it and wow, that was a disappointment because yeah. there was so much distortion. I couldn't get a sharp focus. It would like creep, which is like when you have it on a tripod looking over something and the lens will just kind of like fall out and mm -hmm. won't hold. Um, so yeah, it was just not the way. Luckily, I then got into a class where it was required that you have a 50 millimeter prime lens and you shoot everything with that. And that was the best thing that could have happened because a prime lens that I spent $150 on gave me better images than I ever got with that horrible $600 mistake. Yep. And the 50s are cheap. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Get a nifty 50. Get it or the equivalent if you have a, if you're buying with a crop sensor or a micro four thirds or whatever, it is so versatile. I know that it's just one length, but it's cheap. You can get it for any brand for like under, I would say max $250, but you can get it as, as little as $50. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, even Even knockoffs, uh, like I think Yang Nuo uh, makes a fifty, that's like sixty dollars. It's fine. That the whole the whole point of it is uh, it you know gives you a large aperture, so you can experiment with, experiment with depth of field. Uh, you can shoot in lower light than you normally would be able to, but having having no choice on field of view really makes you think about the image as you're shooting. If you got a super zoom like like the eighteen to two hundred, or even uh, something easy, like a 24 to 70, a lot of times that gives you too much to play with. And so you're just kind of all over the map trying to figure out what your style is, what how, how you like to shoot, what you like to shoot. I think starting with a prime kind of locks you in, makes you focus, no pun, in, pun intended, actually. <laughs> uh, it really helps you hone your own personal style. And that's that's really one of the most important things when you're starting out is figuring out how and why you shoot. Yes. When you're making images, less is more because the more gear you have, the more it's going to get convoluted and your stuff's going to get in your way. But yeah, like you said, just being intentional, mm -hmm. you know, you have to move your body more. You know, you've got to zoom with your feet, like a lot of people say. Yeah. Um, but it is better. It just is. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Period. It is better. And, you know, when you're ready to go to a Zoom because you need a little more flexibility because you recognize that you work better with it, a 2470 or equivalent range is perfect. You will shoot 90% of everything you want to shoot with that lens. If you already know that you're in a specialty, you're shooting, the main reason you're into photography is that you're shooting football games, you know, maybe... 24 to 70 wouldn't be your your next step. Maybe a 70 to 200, 2.8 would be your next step. Um, but for the majority of people, this is going to be the order. I think a lot of people would recommend get a 50 and then get a 24 to 70 and skip the do everything lens and the kit lenses and you're good to go. That's all you need to know. Exactly. The the longer, the wider the zoom range. So like 18 to 200 is a huge zoom range. Now there's 18 to 300 and 18 to 400. Whenever you have a range that big, that only says one thing about that lens. Everything is a compromise. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be good at anything. It's going to be okay at everything, sort of. Yeah. There's your pull quote right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but you're right. And the longer the lens, you know, the more glass elements that are within the lens. So the more chance for them to, you know, become decentered or altered in some way, the more chance there is for damage. It's just a recipe for disaster most of the time. So moving on to number three on the list, um, it's a one, another one of those no brainers. Well, you know, half of a no brainer memory cards is a no brainer, but also a memory card reader, which happens more than you think that people forget to get a reader. Absolutely. And we'll just, <laughs> we'll just, how many people have you talked to on the phone, Joey, who have just plugged their camera into their computer and are wondering why it's taking forever? Oh, over the last nine years? Mm, uh, probably a couple thousand. 
Yeah, it's it's yeah, more common than you think. A memory card reader, just buy it. It's so cheap. Just get it. Right. They'll they'll cost you 10, 15, maybe 20 bucks if you want a high speed one. Most of the time they can handle a bunch of different formats. So, you know, if you end up changing cameras or you have other devices that are using memory cards, it, it's the best and easiest way to do it. Uh and I'll never I'll never back down from that position. Yeah, you can't really go wrong, um, especially if you're going with a pretty common name brand. As far as memory cards go, there are some things to look for. Yeah, definitely stay name brand. Um, SanDisk for sure. Uh, Sony actually makes really good memory cards. And those are really the only ones we really recommend. We stick almost entirely with SanDisk. So talk about... I know on the actual memory card, there are going to be some indicators of what kind of quality we're dealing with. I'm talking speed and class. Um, right. Talk about that a little bit. Um, well, for if you're just doing photo work, none of the speeds are really going to matter. None of the classes are going to matter because you're never going to shoot, f be able to shoot fast enough to, to really limit those cards. <laughs> the faster the card, like if you're shooting a lot of, of bursts, uh, continuous bursts of in images, uh, or if you're, you know, you're getting into sports or something, you do want faster cards to help empty your buffer so you can shoot a burst longer. But for most people, that's not really going to be too much of a problem. If you're getting into photography and you also want to dabble in video, you will need to pay closer attention to, uh, to those classes and speeds, depending on the camera that you're using. Uh, you know, if, if, if it's capable, if it's only capable of doing, HD video, then pretty much any card these days will, will work fine. But if you're doing 4K uh, or anything higher or any kind of like slow-mo stuff or any kind of high bitrate stuff, you'll just want to check whatever your manufacturer recommendations are on speeds. But really, you just want to make sure that you're looking at what camera you have and what it actually takes, what media it takes. And I say at least 32 to 64 gigabytes. Yeah, these days for sure, smaller cards will just fill up faster and be really annoying. But on the other hand, it's safer to have multiple smaller cards than it is to just have one super big card. I agree. Um, now, you know, you can decide what is small for you or what is enough for you, but having multiple cards um, and even recording to both if possible will save you some heartache uh, when you inevitably have it a corrupt card or you lose one in a drain somewhere. Or, something. <laughs> or you know, they get stolen in Las Vegas or something. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> very specific, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, just like everything, cards will fail at some point. Uh, and that goes for lenses and cameras. I guess one thing we should back up and say is be prepared to also shell out for backups, especially memory cards. But, you know, it's always a good idea to have a backup camera if you can. Maybe not your first purchase, but eventually down the road, you're going to want to get a second camera. Same with lenses. It's good to have eventually have a range of things you can choose from so that if something fails, you have something you can use. Absolutely. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to have some sort of like memory card holder system where you can clearly have your cards that are full, your cards that are empty. Um, just really being meticulous with your memory and taking care of your memory cards is important. Um, it will get probably more important once you are doing paid gigs. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, a wedding, for example, any kind of event that you can't slow down, you can't replay memory. And yeah, those backup cameras especially is it's just really important. But that gets into the next the next thing you should have is a backup system of some sort, be it an external drive or uh, some sort of network attached storage system, um, like a RAID setup, and you know, have your workflow down so that when you come home from your gig, the first thing you do is you unload those cards, you make copies, and you make sure that everything is safe and secure and nothing is lost and nothing will get lost and everything is right where you need it when you're ready to start editing. Absolutely. At the very least, mm -hmm. an external drive. And it, it, it becomes very important here to have a solid workflow. Um, you want your, ideally, you want your images in two places at once. 
But if you can avoid saving a bunch of raw files on your computer, your life will be much easier. Your computer will be much happier. I used to be one of those people that would store everything on my computer, even after I was done editing it. And that's just a nightmare. Uh, It slows your computer down. It fills it all up. (laughs) It's like a ticking time bomb. The day I started getting external drives and then eventually upgraded to a network attached storage system, uh, that changed everything for me. Uh, It it really made probably the biggest difference in my workflow. Uh, Do you have any advice on budget? options like a hard like a just an external hard drive and then because I honestly feel like if you're moving on to the RAID systems you're probably I mean some people are just ahead of the curve but you're probably a little bit more advanced yeah uh, like for most people just starting off with a, a simple cheap external drive I mean you can get like a two terabyte drive for you know 60 to 100 bucks these days um, just having one or two of those as, you know, where you dump your stuff, maybe you have two of them so you can double dump. That's a nice cheap way to start cataloging things and backing things up. If, if you're already into having a home server, just incorporating that into your workflow is great. There's brands like Drobo or Synology and a few others out there where, uh, you can actually access your data from anywhere you have an internet connection either on your phone or, you know, out at Starbucks or whatever, Uh, which comes, you know, as you get into dealing with your clients and like wanting them to have access to their images and things, you can send things remotely. Um, If you're out somewhere and somebody says, hey, uh, I really need this image or whatever for such and such client, you can just log on and there it is and send it off and you don't have to be home. These are things you can build on down the road. Yeah. So. Next item on the list, and you know, it's number five, but this is pretty much also essential editing software. Even if you're not doing heavy edits, you, you need you need software to organize, to sort of cool down your your group and make simple adjustments, exposure, white balance, that kind of stuff. Those things are important. It makes your work look uniform and more polished. Yeah. I mean, unless you're a really huge fan of Mr. KR and you only shoot JPEG and you think JPEG straight out of camera are everything you ever need, well, you're probably going to be editing something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't I recommend. I definitely recommend not only getting editing software, but getting software that it is easy to access tutorials because this stuff is not just out of the box user friendly normally. So My first suggestion is the Adobe Creative Suite, the Lightroom, Photoshop, et cetera. I mean, at the very least, get Lightroom and Photoshop. Yeah. I mean, it's 10 bucks a month for a subscription. Uh, It's super cheap. Um, It even comes with some cloud storage. That's kind of the go-to. There are now a bunch of people that really like Capture One, which is just an alternative. It's a little more expensive. So, uh, and you can get trials for both of them and see which one you like better. Yeah, and you should probably be able, there's enough people using Capture One that you'll be able to also find resources about that. If you're a total cheapskate, you can always get the free uh, GIMP software, uh, which stands for GNU uh, Image Manipulation Program. Um, It's come a long way since its early open source days. Uh, I still don't like it, uh, but it has a hardcore small following. Uh, It is totally free. Uh, And it should do pretty much everything you need, but it's open source. Um, The documentation can be kind of hard to get through. It's not super popular. So finding tutorials and things are going to be harder, but you know, it's free and that's why people like it. And again, at the end of the day, um, when you're starting out, it's not going to matter. I mean, arguably it's never going to matter. Um, (laughs) This, these small differences, just shoot in raw, I guess. Just right. We, we should have mentioned that. Shoot in raw. Just yeah, do that, yeah. please. We'll back up. We'll just back it up. Uh, <laughs> shoot raw. Be ready to edit, and you know, try, pick one. Basically, just pick one and go with it. And as you get used to it, it'll get easier and better, and you'll get better at it. 
Okay, well, that is a great place to take a break. And when we come back, we'll do six through 10. And number six is my favorite piece of gear on the list. If you only know lens rentals from our yelling about cameras on the internet, there's more to the story. We're actually the largest online videography and photography equipment rental house in the entire world. Cameras, lenses, lights, audio, drones, just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to lensrentals.com and tell us what you need and when you need it. We ship it straight to you in protective cases. You use it for whatever your heart desires, then ship it back to us with the included return label. Next time you need equipment for a shoot, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your order. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Okay, welcome back. We are going to start off with number six, which is my favorite piece of gear on the list. I originally had this just as, you know, light modification, but really a reflector. You want to learn how to modify natural light. I am of the opinion that you really want to try to understand light before you move into strobes or other artificial light and a mod a yeah, a reflector is such a good tool, especially and specifically a 5-in-1 or something that offers a diffusion panel, a white card, a black card, and then oftentimes they'll have a gold side to warm up your image and a silver side to give you a bit more contrast. Mm -hmm. These things are so fun and they're super lightweight and they fold down. You can use them alone. Um, It's easier to have help, but you can manage them alone. You just, this is such a good tool to have and you can spend anywhere from 20 bucks to a hundred bucks, but they are so cheap as well. Yeah, they are so cheap and so versatile. Um, Getting a reflector and learning how to manipulate that natural light is the first step into truly seeing light instead of just, I like this, this image. I, I like this scene right here because this light looks good. Like, does it? Well, it can. That's the thing. You look at any lighting situation and you can turn it into something beautiful. It's just about understanding how. And when it comes to the reflectors specifically, I will say one thing. Uh, Bigger, in my opinion, bigger is better. And I would go I would go with one that's about waist height, something that you can just prop onto your own body so that you can shoot and reflect at the same time or easily have your subject hold or easily prop onto something. Yeah. the pop. I think one of the more popular sizes out there is like 42 inches in, uh, in diameter. Those are great. Nice and big. The larger the reflector, the softer the, the light coming off of it's going to be. It's just a great idea. Love it. So we're, we're all in agreement. We're all going to buy a reflector right now. Yeah. Everybody buy them. <laughs> Make a run on reflectors. And then, Joey, we're graduating to? Speed lights. Yes. You want to graduate eventually to artificial light, and you want it to be compact and portable and versatile, and you get those. Oh, wait, and let me not forget cheap, okay, because we're not trying to go too far into debt here. Right. Everybody, (laughs) I made the mistake of jumping right into studio strobes. Uh, I bought this two light Ellen Chrome kit that was way beyond anything I was ready for. And oh, that was an expensive mistake. You are too fancy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know me. I'm I'm fancy. <laughs> Look, I love if you do, if you are too good for speed lights, which you aren't, but if you think that, then maybe get like some Einsteins, some alien bees. Again, if you don't want to spend a bunch of money, if you want it to be super compact, and here's the thing with speed lights, you can go generic. You can get, you know, it's not it's not going to be the best, but you know, I shot a really favorite image in my in my senior thesis with a speed an off brand speed light duct taped to a broken light stand. Yes, I mean, yes. If it produces light, you can use it. You know. I agree. Uh, speed lights. I eventually dumped both of those Ellen Chrome strobes and ended up acquiring like four speed lights. I like speed lights because when you're first starting out with artificial light, it's TTL. So you don't have to think so much about what your settings are. 
the camera can help you figure it out. I would recommend getting lights that you do have some manual control over, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because as helpful as TTL through the lens automatic, basically, um, as helpful as that is, it can also be frustrating if you're not getting the look that you want, because what it's doing is saying this is a correct setting but maybe you don't want a correct setting. Maybe you want a moodier vibe. Right. Um, so you do want to have some manipulation, some control. Right. Like the first thing, you also want to make sure uh, the speed light has a head that can move around because learning how to bounce your flash is, is clutch. That is just easy modification number one. Like you're in a room, you're taking some pictures, everything looks kind of washed out. Boom, you move the head to bounce off the ceiling or off to the wall on the side. Now you've got this huge light source that's reflecting back. It's nice and soft and your image totally changes. And all you had to do was tilt that head a little bit. So you're kind of thinking, are you thinking the speed light is on the camera at this point or just in any case? Yeah, that's, that's why I like speed lights to start with because you can start them on camera and then quickly move them off camera once you get ready to. Exactly. And uh, to the point of saving money, if you're only holding up speed lights, your light stands can be pretty frail, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. They can, you can have really collapsible light stands and also any modifiers that you want to use. Again, that's your shoot-through umbrella. That's your little pop-up softbox or whatever you want to use. Those are also going to be smaller and less expensive. Yeah. I think those Manfrotto nano stands are like, they're dirt cheap. And they're perfect for speed lights. Yeah. And you can get a shoot through umbe- umbrella for like 15 bucks. Yep. And that's going to give you a nice soft light. You know, it's not going to give you a huge range of lights. What am I? Th- surface area. But if you have several, you can start playing around with multi light setups. Whereas if you're buying multiple strobes, that would be kind of intense. And speed lights, as long as you're staying within the, the manufacturer, uh, especially Canon stuff. They will all work together very, very well. And those are, you know, that's if you choose to really get some nicer ones because the Canon speed lights are really nice. Um, I think the kind of smaller, more entry level one, the 430 EX3, mm-hmm. you can get it for about $250. Mm-hmm. So again, and not it's, pennies. It's a, li- it's a lot of light for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but at the very least, you'll want, if you don't want to go with a speed light kit for your lighting, if you are doing mostly natural light, it's not a bad idea to get at least one to have in your bag um, because there will be a situation where you're going to need a little help, need a little extra light. And if you have a camera body that comes with a pop-up flash, don't use it. It's bad and it's not your friend. Oh, pop-up flashes are the worst. You know, unless you're intentionally trying to go for that snapshot look, which, hey, can be cool. I've done it. Um, but I doubt you are. Uh, so <laughs> don't rely on that pop-up flash because there's you just have zero control over it. Right, right. Okay, what's next, Joey? Well, uh, number eight on the list. What are you going to put all this gear in? Camera bags or what? Yeah, you don't want it jingle jangling around in your backpack because it will break. The lens cap is going to fall off. Your front element's ac- accidentally going to get scratched. These are all things that I have done and have happened to me. Same. <laughs> oh, there's there's so many different kinds of bags, though. So, uh, you know, there's slings, messenger bags, backpacks, hard cases, roller cases. You're, only you are going to know what's best for you and wor- what works best for you. My advice, don't get one that looks like a camera bag because that's dorky. (laughs) 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 No, I'm kidding. It, I mean, it is, but (laughs) you also are very easily identified as like having camera gear and, you know, that may be fine to you, but I think you're more likely to take your camera around with you if you have a cool looking bag that you would be wearing anyway. I know that Joey, you and I both love the Dom key bags that are this oh, just canvas they um, are cotton the best bags ever. Yeah, they protect your gear, but they also look super cool. Um, mm-hmm. But what's really good, and why I can't I can't believe I haven't done it yet, but you can just get a camera bag insert that protects all your lenses and stuff, and then you can put it in a bag that you already own. Mm-hmm. 
that's like obvious solution right there. It's not rocket science, a camera bag. You just want padding on all sides of each piece of gear. That's pretty much it. And some dividers in there to help you separate things out. Absolutely. You just don't want it, which, you know, when you've been when you've been photographing long enough, you are going to just throw your gear around <laughs> like it cost you five bucks. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, it's good to have a nice protective um, camera bag. Yeah. And then if you're looking at hard cases, uh, Pelicans are great, but they're also expensive. Uh, and if you're looking for a cheaper alternative, uh, Harbor Freight sells their Apache brand cases and they're like a third of the price and they're they're excellent this is like if you need to fly somewhere and Mm -hmm. you don't want to carry your gear on uh so scary situation but even if you're flying and you are carrying on this is when i would be getting a hard case for my gear if you are traveling a lot even in the car if you're going to be putting your your gear you know in the back with a bunch of other people's luggage or whatever yeah hard case you know, it's a little heavier. It's a little more serious, but sometimes. And, and those hard cases will last you forever. I've had my Pelican 1510 for 10 years now, and it's still great. Well, you you carry a lot of stuff at a time. I mean. I do. I do. You're always using a tripod setup. And speaking of, that is number nine on our list. A Tripods. Tripod You know, a tripod, a lot of people will say is just so, so important, and it is. That's why it's on this list. But it's kind of like number nine because you're not – you're either going to or you're not going to use it. Right, right. (laughs) You know, Joey is a going to use it every day. I am a – literally could not tell you where my tripod is right now. (laughs) No idea. You know what kind of tripod it is? I don't, that's the thing. I, I think it's a Manfrotto. I bought it mm, like five years ago at least. Um, so yeah, no, I don't know where it is. Um, but this is one thing that I learned a lesson on. It was like the third tripod that I bought because I was trying to be kind of budget conscious um, and I kept getting tripods and tripod heads that were just not supporting my gear as well as I needed it to where they would break, just flimsy. Um, And I learned the hard way that you have to spend a good chunk on a tripod if you want it to be super solid for what you're doing. There are some really good travel tripods that are light and lightweight, but will still carry, you know, 13 to 15 pounds, which is really, you don't want to go below that, in my opinion. Right. I mean, just think think about it this way. You're putting... You're you're putting your camera and your lens that probably cost you a couple grand on top of something, and you're hoping it doesn't fall. Mm. So mm-hmm. spend enough to where it doesn't fall. Exactly. Yes. And y- yeah, you want a nice you want a nice tripod. Carbon fiber is nice. Um, um, you said you have a Manfrotto. That's an amazing brand to start with. Again, you're going to be spending some cash. Um. Kind of a more budget brand that I, well, let me know if this is wrong. I I feel like it's a budget brand that does really well. Um, and this is one that we carry at Lens Rentals. But the Mi Photo has some carbon fiber tripods that are rated for like 13 to 15 pounds that are meant for travel. And they are adequate. Yeah, I love our little Mi Photo tripods. I also really like our Enduro tripods um, that are a bit cheaper than, than Manfrotto options. So either one of those are great. Also, I will say tripods are one of the only things that I think you can get good deals used because most people don't beat them all to hell. Most people just either stop using them and get rid of them or they outgrow them like they get a bigger, heavier camera and their smaller tripods just not cutting it anymore. Yeah, it's people like me, the no tripod people. They're selling their tripod that they thought they needed. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how I got. Um, I have a Bogan, um, a Bogan three three forty six tripod. It's a monster. It is a monster of a tripod. I got it for seventy five bucks off of Craigslist. It's like a five hundred dollar at the time. It was like a five hundred dollar tripod. It's big and heavy, and the only thing I use it for is my large format cameras. That is insane you really do get good deals on stuff you've got to take me shopping at some point because you get the bargains uh, let's go girl i got <laughs> you 
very good at it. Um, but all joking inside, there are some times when you absolutely do need a tripod. So if you are doing low lights, like long exposure stuff, time lapse, macro photography, if you need it for like group portraits that you're a part of or like HDR, there are a lot of situations where, yes, you can't get around needing a tripod. And if these are just occasional things that you do, again, you can buy used or you can buy one of the you know, just make sure that you're looking at how much the tripod actually weighs and how much it actually has the capacity to carry. And whatever the capacity that it can carry is rated for, um, subtract five pounds from that and that's what it can carry. Yep, absolutely. Do not ever push it to the limit. And uh, if it ha- if it's got a center column or a hook underneath the head that you can hang a weight from, even better. Absolutely. I would, you know what? I was thinking about putting some honorable mentions like a sandbag, you Mm -hmm. know, a few sandbags. Not practical to just have around all the time, but yeah, something that has a hook, you can just put your, you can just hang your camera bag on it that has your other stuff in it. Any other tripod thoughts? Mm, Oh, uh, there's different types of heads. The kind of head that you want is just going to be dependent on the type of photography you're doing. I usually don't re- recommend pan and tilt heads unless you're doing video work. I just don't like them. Uh, but ball heads are great. Um, ball heads are great. You just get a ball head. They're best. They're the best. <laughs> ball head. Ball. That's what you need. Yes. Yeah. Again, that's going to be just as important as your tripod as far as getting something quality because if your ball head is not tightening, and your camera and lens is just drifting when you're, you know, when your knobs are as tight as they can go, that's a bad day. That's a bad shoot. And any any good tripod is going to have a removable head. I wouldn't buy a tripod that it's got a permanently attached head because, you know, maybe the legs are great, but the head that you got isn't really what you need. So you want to upgrade or swap it out. Uh, and if, you know, if it's a removable head, you can do that. So like all the Manfrotto stuff is swappable, uh, the Mifoto stuff, the Enduro stuff, uh, you can buy legs separate from heads. So if you like a brand of head from a different manufacturer, you could just do like I did where I just Frankenstein it all together and it works great. It fits my needs perfectly. So you can also just call Joey personally. He will walk you through picking out. I'll even help you find a bargain. Yeah, and his <laughs> cell phone number will be in the show. Five 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 four 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 four. Okay. Um. Go. Actually, this kind of goes along with the tripod number ten, last on our list. Um. And yeah, least important of everything else, remote trigger. Super super cool thing to have in your bag. And if you're a person who needs a tripod, you also need a trigger. Absolutely. Triggers are wonderful, cheap little things. You can get wired or wireless, whichever one you think you need. There's a million different companies that make them. All the third-party ones are cheap and fine. Yeah, they're they're not expensive. Um, well, at least, yeah, now I would say like 20 to 100, but probably closer to 20. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, remote triggers, especially the wireless ones, this really frees you to do you know, if you're more artistic to do self-portraiture or if you're doing weddings, it makes a photo booth way easier or any kind of event makes a photo booth way easier. Yeah, it's just super cool. If you're doing long exposures, you're not going to shake the camera. If you're doing time lapse, just any of that stuff, this is just going to make your life so much easier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's not really anything else to say about it. You need it. You need it. So Yeah. That's it on that. Um, So, yeah, honorable mentions. There are some things that we did not mention that you should probably still buy. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Like you should, if you don't have them right now, go to the store or order online. Rechargeable AA and AAA batteries. Yes, absolutely. I mean, even if you're not a photographer, what are you doing if you don't have rechargeable batteries? Save the planet. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I I love Interloops, uh, but if you don't want to shell out the money for Interloops, if you live near an Ikea, their Lada batteries are nice and cheap and rechargeable. Anything else that 
you would say, hey, maybe this is good to keep in the camera bag? Um, there's things I always have on me. Um, I have a little pocket knife that has a pen built in um, and scissors and everything. That's always good to have. Uh, gaff tape is excellent to always have on you. You never know when you're not, when you're going to need it. I keep a few sheets of cinefoil in my bag. Uh, I like to use it uh, to modify speed lights, either to make it like a little snoot or a flag. Uh, it's just infinitely useful and cheap. I would say maybe put a couple lens cloths in there. Oh, put, yeah. Put, lens put, some, cloth. uh, put some cleaning supplies. Not too much. You don't need that much stuff. Just maybe a lens pen and a lens wipe because you're going to accidentally smudge your finger across the front element. Yeah. And if you have, oh, oh, uh, a blower, absolutely get a, a rocket blower. Everyone should have like eight of these. I think I have, I think I actually have like eight of them. Yeah. I think like two is probably fine, but yeah, two, two's fine. But uh, <laughs> especially, especially if you are buying a mirrorless camera, a blower will help you keep that sensor cleaner than just about anything else. Uh, also, learn how to clean your sensor and buy a sensor cleaning kit. Okay. And, Yes, very cool um, and helpful. Maybe like after a while. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> you know, don't be afraid of it. Just, just be a little your... afraid. Be like yeah. a little afraid. Afraid enough. <laughs> 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 afraid enough not to like damage your sensor. Okay, that's um, fair. Ha have a healthy respect. How about that? Yeah, get a get a blower at minimum. Find a local shop that can do a cleaning for you that doesn't charge you an arm and a leg if you never want to touch your own sensor. But the blower will prevent you from having to go to them as often. That's great advice. And that wraps up our list. I hope you found this really helpful. Um, you know, and remember that gear is not going to make you a better photographer, but it can hold you back. It can sort of <laughs> help. It can hold you back from developing pun intended, um, <laughs> some great photographs. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. And we will link a bunch of this stuff in the show notes. Uh, so you can just go shopping on our blog post. Hell yeah. Spend that money. Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals podcast. Like Sarah said, we'll have links in the show notes to everything we covered here. And if there are any video folks listening, we didn't forget about you. Keep an eye out for the next version of this episode where we'll cover the 10 pieces of gear videographers should pick up first. The Lens Rentals podcast is a production of LensRentals.com. If you've got a question or topic you'd like covered on the show, email us at podcast at LensRentals.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-609-LENS. That's 901-609-LENS. If you're enjoying the show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. Make sure to check the show notes for a link to this week's coupon code. And as always, Roger Sokala will leave you with an inspirational quote. Don't think about making art, just get it done. Let everyone else decide if it's good or bad, whether they love it or whether they hate it. And while they're deciding, make more art. Andy Warhol.